today man so we are in the fourth part of our message series entitled my big fat mouth how many of you know someone in your life with a big fat mouth nobody right no somebody how many of us have big fat mouths right how many of us have said things we regret wish we could take it back or how many of us have said things like I do this all the time and I'm like I didn't mean it that way and somehow Joe Marie or my daughters always hear something that I didn't mean and I'm going to share with you guys a story. It's the infamous bridge moment. I don't know where Joe Marie's at. I don't see her, so that's probably good. Because I, I think we're still fighting about this one. I'm not sure. So some years ago, we're driving over a bridge. Now, if you know me, you know I love the country. I love fishing. I love hiking. I mean, anything outdoors, absolutely love it. So we're driving over this amazing bridge. We're going over an expanse. Oh, there's Joe Marie. Uh, we're going over a, a, a bridge, and I'm going over this beautiful river or lake. I don't remember what it was. And now I'm looking, and I'm looking this way. Now I see the, the left lane, so there's no beautiful view there. There's trucks and cars passing me. So I'm like just taking it all in, God's creation. It's amazing. And, and I look out her window, her window's down, and, and I'm looking out, and I'm going to tell you, I remember what I saw. I just don't remember where it was. It was literally these big hills, mountains, just coming into the water, and it looked like the bottom of them were disappearing. It was amazing. So then I look out her window as I'm staring, driving. I know my eyes should have been on the road, but they weren't. And I'm like, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. God's creation. See, she's smiling at me. I'm sorry. I know you didn't know I'm sharing this because I think we're still like kind of fighting about this, laughing about it years later, right? Because every time we go over a bridge, she's like, beautiful, isn't it? So then she looks at me. Now she's in this seat, right? And she's like, honey, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm like, now I'm over here. I'm like, thank you for what? This is the opposite truth. Now, how many of you guys know where I'm sitting right now? I'm in that moment, right? Now, what would you have responded with, right? What might some of you have said? You welcome. welcome, right? But I'm too dumb for that. I didn't know what she was talking about. So she's like, thank you so much, honey. And I'm like, thank you for what? And she was like, you said I'm beautiful. And I was like, no, I didn't mean you. I meant, the, I meant the, I'm so sorry. I just got to feel so bad. I feel so bad. So I'm telling everybody, but it's true. So, so, cause I'm, I'm just like, kind of like a dumb guy. And I was like, and then I tried, like my foot is in my mouth. I'm tasting it. And it's slowly going past my uvula, down my trachea. And I'm like, no. And now I saw her face change. Like it went kind of red. And, and I'm like thinking in my head, oh my gosh, what did I say? Why is she so upset? I didn't catch on yet. And then I got it and I was like, oh, I missed my moment. <laughs> so then I'm trying to backpedal. I'm trying to like totally be defensive, protect myself. I'm like, honey, but look, I'm looking at God's creation and look at the mountain, the way it goes in the water. And she's like, just stop it. That hurt. And I'm like, I'm like, what hurt? I, I don't know. I, I didn't say you weren't beautiful. I was looking at that. And then I'm like, at least I'm not lying to you. And she's like, I ain't about what? I'm God's creation too. <laughs> Guys, it didn't go anywhere well, I promise you. And then the whole ride, I'm sitting there throwing a self-pity party, like, I feel so misunderstood. That's not what I meant. You are beautiful. And she's like, I know, but now it don't count that you said it because you messed it up already. So every time we go over a bridge, those moments happen. So, hey, look, we all say dumb things, right? I mean, some of the dumb things we say are totally by accident like that was. I threw myself in a hole and then buried myself. And some things we do are very much on purpose, right? And our big fat mouths get us in trouble all the time. And today what we're going to talk about is how lying creates a big fat mouth situation. And some of us as husbands or wives, we can, we can understand that, right? Sometimes, you know, in marriages, you live with somebody long enough and you're like, oh, I don't want that response, so let me soften the truth a little bit. Or sometimes our teenagers or children lie to parents because you're like, man, I, don't, I, I want to avoid a consequence, so I'm going to tell them what they want to hear. And so many of us 
get caught up in lies. And most of the time, our lies come to light, because what does Scripture remind us? What happens in darkness will be exposed in light. And actually, the aftermath of a lie is 10 times worse. Growing up uh, with, my, you know, raising my kids, my wife and I always said this, man, if you're honest with us, don't worry about getting in trouble. Tell me the truth. Don't ever lie to me. If you lie to me, whatever that consequence was, it's going to be like 100 times fold because you lied. And I would rather you mess up than show bad character and integrity. So that was really what we held them accountable to. Uh, but so many of us walk in here today and we're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Lying's a sin. Lying's wrong. But what we don't often get is what to do with it when we find ourselves in it. And if you're honest, people, we lie all the time. We lie because what is truth? Truth is 100% unfiltered truth. If you leave out 1%, it's, it's a lie. If you embellish 1%, it's a lie. If you hide what somebody would want to know for self-preservation, it's a lie. Um, anything lacking 100% truth is a lie. So that most of us are accidental liars, right? We fall into it through self-preservation. Other times we lie and we don't even know it. It's like it goes totally under the radar. Uh, think about it this way. You're, you're in school, in college, I want to be liked. So we present ourselves a certain way that's not fully true so that we can be liked, right? Some of us lie for validation. We lie for affirmation. We lie so that people will like us. People will love us. We want people to be proud of us, impressed with us. So we embellish who we really are. That's lying. But that type of lying goes under the radar. Most of us don't wake up in the morning thinking, man, I want to lie today and I want to deceive people. I want to take advantage of people. I want to rob them as much as I possibly can. Some of you might wake up that way, but the majority of people don't. But here's the good news. No matter what the core of your lie is, Jesus is your answer. That's the reality. No matter whether you're a pathological liar or the accidental liar, or you just eat your foot a lot like I do accidentally and try to backpedal it a little bit, uh, man, Christ is sufficient because what, what I know is that there's forgiveness for sins. And every one of us has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. There's one time I want to share with you guys, actually not one, many times. I have three daughters and a son. My son is a little easier, but my three daughters, they tempt me to lie a lot. That's the truth, okay? They tempt me to lie. Now, don't go start judging me. Hear the story, okay? So my daughters, ever since they were little, um, especially as I became teenagers, Dad, how do I look in this? And what I want to say always is, man, you look amazing. You are so beautiful. I love your hair. I love your makeup. Sometimes they come down, Dad what do you think of my new makeup thing? And I feel tempted in that moment. Dad, what do you think about my new hair or my hair color? Guys, there's times I don't like it. There's times I'm like, you need to take that butt upstairs and go change because like, you got ripped off. Half of your shirt's missing. Like, go change. <laughs> Guys, let me, let me just encourage you. Buy full-length shirts. You get more bang for your money, okay? So, so I get caught in that moment a lot, and I feel tempted to lie to my kids and the truth is, thankfully, I don't because I actually give them a gift. And there's one thing that my daughters always know. No matter what, if I go to dad, he's going to give me the truth. Now, I will tell you most of the time, I'm like, honey, you look amazing. You look beautiful. Man, that outfit looks great on you. But there's sometimes I got to give truth because truth sets people free. You need to understand that. It's hard to hear, but it's good medicine. And if I'm not going to be honest with them as someone who claims to love them, their father, man, is anyone else in this world going to be honest with them? Right? It's, a, it's a wonderful gift. So then sometimes I feel, uh, I, I get put in that position by my wife. She comes in and she's like, how do I look in this? And I'm like, honey, you look amazing, man. No matter what you buy, no matter what you wear or how you wear it, you look amazing. Now, some of you are judging me and you're like, yo, that can't possibly be true. She's human. Guys, I'm not lying because she knows better than I do. She knows more than I do. She, she knows style. I don't. So I just, man, you look great and amazing, right? I don't lie to my wife either. You always look great. But sometimes, sometimes we get caught in the lies and we can't even help it. So how bad is the lying problem? Uh, the uh, University of Massachusetts did a study on lying. And they discovered that the average person cannot have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. The average person, I'm going to tell you what the stat actually is. 60% of people in the study could not have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. The average person in the study, it was normed on Americans, so I'm sure it's not different anywhere else in the world. The heart, people, their locations may be different, but the broken heart is still the same. The average person lies minimum four times in a day. And the heart of the lie is often not to deceive. Uh, what they discovered is people lie to impress people. 
People lie to be liked. People lie to be loved. People want to be celebrated. The truth is we're all just making up for our brokenness inside as people. They also discovered people lie to self-protect. Let's be real. We are all a hot mess, right? Do I have anybody in this room that's not a hot mess at times? Nobody. We all have challenges. We all have certain upbringings. We all have life wounds. And most of our deception is actually self-deception. We lie to ourselves first before we lie to anybody else. And, and, and the thing is, we can look at that and say, you know, but that type of lying, the accidental liar, that doesn't seem as bad or evil as somebody who does it pathologically to swindle, to take advantage of people. But, I mean, let's, let's have an honest moment, right? If you've ever held anything from your wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, that, that, that's pretty evil because it's actually self-worship. You see, when we lie to people, no matter what the reason is, it's often you're going to be cheated, I'm going to benefit at your expense. What I hold back from you really benefits me, whether I don't want the consequence, or maybe I don't want you finding something out I may have done, maybe in the past, because I have to deal with the consequences in your pain. It, the reality is lying is some of the most selfish things we do in all relationships, and it is the power to destroy relationships. Jesus died for all lying, whether it's pathological or it's accidental, right? And all of us need to be honest with ourselves. If you've lied once, what are we? We're liars, right? If you've stolen once, what, what are we? We're, we're thieves. And, and the truth is, not any one of you, including myself, can say we haven't done those things at some point in our lives. So, so what's your good news message? You can sit here in guilt and shame, or you can recognize, especially if you're new to the spiritual journey, and you're like, man, I don't know what I believe about God. Man, I got to tell you this forgiveness in God. Literally, when you give your life to Jesus, you become a follower of Jesus. He literally wipes your past away as if it never happened. Every lie you ever told, it's as if it never, ever happened. You get a fresh start, a new beginning, a reset. Man, you get to start all over again in Jesus. You never have to wear that guilt, never wear that shame, never wear that regret. You are made right in Christ. And the guarantee God gives you is eternity in heaven. Man, that's the best news I ever heard because the reality is I know what I'm capable of, I know what I've done, and I know who I am apart from Jesus. I know who I am apart from the Holy Spirit's work in my life. Why do I aspire not to lie today, to live in truth, to have character, to have integrity? I aspire because I want to be like like Jesus. Now, in my own strength, I can't be, but the Holy Spirit is a promise that's given to every believer, and his job in your life is to make you more like Christ. Isn't that the best news you ever heard? So many of us want and need a new beginning today, and it's available to you. So why does God, well, I mean, let me say this, what's the problem with lying? Why does God have such an issue with that? I think it's because God sees what we don't, and he sees and knows what lying will do to your life and do to all your relationships. Proverbs 12, 22 says this, the Lord detests, another version says, it's an abomination to the Lord, uh, lying lips. But he delights in those who tell the truth. The word abomination in one version, uh, the Lord detests in the version we're reading. The, the original Hebrew word for that was abomination, disgust. It brings God to a point of nausea, this idea of lying in your life. Because God sees what it does to you and what it does to your family. It literally brings in dysfunction into your home. When you lie, you open a door to the enemy in your life to sift you, to hurt you, to break you, and to break the relationships that we have in our lives. And the worst part is the habits we develop as people of influence, parents, aunts, uncles, older siblings, you're actually passing behaviors down to the next generation. That's what generational sin is. That's what a generational curse is. It's habits of behavior that are passed down. But here's the good news. In Christ, I can hand down a Christ-centered legacy to my children, a legacy of faith that is combined with a promise, right? This is that repentant moment. God, I'm going to turn away from lying, stealing, cheating, everything that is detestable to you, God, and I'm going to make myself alive to Jesus by saying, Jesus, become the Lord and Savior of my life. Man, I'm going to walk in your ways, God. Man, I can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So then God empowers me to live the life of Christ. And then the promise is that if I raise my kids in the way of the Lord, though they will depart from it for a short period of time, we've seen that, right, with teenagers and young adults, they won't depart from long, Scripture says. They will always come back. It's a promise of God that your children 
will be sanctified through your faith. What does that mean? It doesn't guarantee them salvation. God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has firstborns. What I mean by that is this. Every person, even your kids, has to make a decision to follow Jesus. Just because you grew up in church, just because you're a pastor's kid or a minister's kid, doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. Just as much as being in a garage doesn't make you a car. My kids hate that saying. My wife has said it until they've turned blue and exploded, right? Like, but it's such a truth statement. God only has firstborn kids firstborn children. And we all have to make that decision. But we have to be aware of what it is we pass down. I'm going to give you guys a little story. My grandparents have passed down some wonderful legacies of faith. Matter of fact, they came to Christ in a a revival that swept across Europe and uh, and the Western world and even India uh, in the 1940s. Uh, My family came to know Jesus. They were not Christ followers, not all of them, some of them. Um, And with that, they prayed prayers. They prayed prayers for the generations. I'm a pastor today because of prayers that were uh, probably prayed eight, ten decades ago. I mean, r- really a long time ago, you know, and, uh, and, and that's why I'm here today. However, with that legacy of faith, they also handed down certain things that I had to get right in my life that were passed on to me. They're a trauma generation, right? My great-grandparents, my grandparents, they went through World War I. Actually, they saw the, the, uh, the Spanish flu, right, which killed like millions of people. Like they lived through that. They saw World War I. Um, man, in Italy, they saw the Great Depression, which was worse than it was in the U.S. Then they saw World War II. And when Italy fell, my family, uh, both sides of my family, were actually living in caves for four to five years, uh, trying to avoid um, capture from uh, the Nazis uh, when they invaded Italy. And what ended up happening with that is the Nazis would go in, they, they uh, stole, they pillaged, they plundered, they raped women, they took people uh, and, and really um, forced slavery in many ways. And my family was living in caves. And there's two legacies that they passed down, two, I think, generational curses, I would, I would say. Uh, one, um, they had this belief that was even spoken to me as a young kid. They would say things like, whatever you have, have a double of it because you might lose it, it might break, somebody might steal it. So now as as a young man, man, I had doubles or triples of everything. I'm really into tools. If you know me, I love building and fixing things. I didn't have one drill. I had five. I didn't have one power washer. I had two or three. I didn't have one hammer. I had a whole drawer of hammers. Why? Because you never know when you're going to need one. And then I would hide tools at different parts of the house. And every bedroom would get their only little their, their own little toolbox. So I never had to go to the garage anymore. And you know what I was doing? I, I was actually, I, I learned hoarding out of fear because of a a generation that lived in trauma that didn't know what they were passing on to the next generation was was trauma. Another thing that I learned growing up was my family would say, family first, blood above all things. If anyone messes with anyone in your family, I'm just going to tell you the words that my uncles use, kill them, end them, because that's how they lived uh, in Italy, right? So they believed that there was a threat around every corner and that, man, when it's time to protect your family, violence is the answer. I grew up in the Bronx, and you know what? I'm going to tell you guys a quick story that solidified that truth in my life before I met Jesus. I remember I was eight years old, and I was getting bullied by this 16-year-old kid who was way bigger than me as a kid. Now, I was a hothead. I was tough as an eight-year-old, but no eight-year-old is not fighting no 15, 16-year-old. And my dad saw me, and this kid was going at me. You would think a good dad would come in and rescue. My dad did not. He wanted to see what would happen. And and we were playing stickball as a kid. If you grew up in the Bronx, that's what we played, because you couldn't really afford a baseball bat, so you take brooms apart. You'd play stickball, and I was playing stickball, and I grabbed this kid's bat, stickball bat, and I was going to crack, like that was a Bronx word, right? I was going to crack this kid, and just as I grabbed the bat, I started running at him, and my dad actually came from across the street. I lived across the street from the schoolyard, and he was sitting on the stoop watching this with my aunt. Somehow, he was like, uh, man, just sped over there. He grabbed the bat as I cocked that thing back. He grabbed it, and he said, I got this. He steps in front of me, and he spoke to the 15, 16-year-old, and he says, you're trying to pick on my son who's younger than you, and you know what? He looks at me, he goes, Armando, crack him. I didn't really want to hit the kid, to be honest with you, but it just got real. I just wanted to scare him and make him run away, and my dad said, crack him, and then I knew that if I didn't, that is something he always said to me, right? If anybody bullies you and you don't fight them, even if you lose, that's fine. Just fight. If you don't fight, when you get home, you're fighting me. So I grew up. It's a, it was a it was a serious, like, culture of trauma. So you know what I did? Hitting this kid is a lot better than getting beat up by my dad. So I cracked back. And I went to go swing, and my dad again stopped it. And then he spoke to me, spoke to the kid, broke it up. And that day on, what did I learn from my dad? Don't come home unless I fought back. So now I'm a brand-new father. I'm a follower of Jesus. And you know what? I was, man, I'm going to protect my kids like a lion because I thought there was a threat around every single corner, under every rock, but there was no threat. There often is not a threat, but somehow 
I was raised to believe that there was. And when I came to Jesus, I recognized, God, I have a problem. I hoard because I have fears that never really originated with me. And God, I'm, I'm a violent person by nature. I love MMA, boxing. Not to say any of that is wrong, but my heart was wrong because I was trained to be a protector in a, in a world that was no longer the world they came from. And you know what? Jesus did a work on me, and he delivered me. So you know what I did with all my hoarding? Anything I had two of or more, I would give them away and just keep the one I needed. And you know what happened when it broke or it went missing? God always provided another one. So I learned to trust God. And you know what I recognized? Man, this, the Holy Spirit spoke to me one day. You know, you're so busy getting stressed out about your kids and yourself and your wife. The reality is when you go to bed at night, you go to bed in faith. You don't even know if you're breathing when you're sleeping. And you, on faith, are hoping I'm going to wake you up in the morning. And I realized, what in this world do I really truly control? Nothing. Nothing. I can't even control whether I wake up tomorrow. So I learned to trust God. The antidote to, if you're a controller, I'm going to tell you this. The antidote to your control is trust. You control because you don't trust. We hold on to those pathological things that have been taught to us and pass them down to our kids because we don't trust. And God hates sin. He's going to sit in a judgment seat over sin. Now, if you give your life to Jesus, God will not judge you because God is both lover of your soul. God is love. But God is also a righteous judge, not a bad judge, a righteous judge who will judge sin and death and disease and all that sin has brought into the world. Why? Because he wants you to be healthy and in right standing with him. And that's made possible through Jesus, right? So I'm going to share with you guys a story that uh, God brought me to as I was preparing this message. And it's really the, a story of a dysfunctional family that became dysfunctional because of what we, they were handing down over time. It's actually in Genesis 27, for those of you who want to follow along. And it's a story of Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac is an older man. Uh, he's going blind, or, or he is blind, right, in the story. And he um, calls his son Esau, his oldest son. He had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And he calls Esau the firstborn, and he's like, Son, I want you to go out. I want you to hunt game for me and make it the way I like because I'm getting old in years. I want to eat this meal. He acted like it was his last supper, right? Now, I want to eat this meal, and then I'm going to give you the blessing you've been waiting your whole life for. So Esau's all excited, and he's like, man, my dad is going to bless me. I'm going to get this inheritance. So he goes out, and he starts hunting, but Rebecca had actually overheard this conversation that Isaac had with Esau, and she's like, man, you know what? Esau, he's a good son, but I prefer, like, love Jacob more than Esau. And she conspired against her husband and her, her own son. And she says, Jacob, man, I'm I want you to go out and I want you to get two lambs. And I'm going to cook those lambs just the way your father likes. And you're going to act like, you're going to lie and say you're Esau. You're going to bring this food to your father that I have made. And he's going to give you your brother's blessing. And Jacob's like, mom, dad's going to curse me. If I get caught, rather than a blessing, I'm going to receive a curse. And she says, no, if that happens, let that curse be on me. What she didn't know was that she was speaking a curse over her own life in that moment. And then Jacob's like, but my brother's a hairy dude. He kind of stinks a little bit. Man, I'm clean. I'm shaven, smooth skin. And she's like, you know, what? we're going to grab that lamb skin. We're going to put it over your arms and your shoulders, just in case you're or the back of your neck, just in case your dad touches you. And he's going to think that you're Esau. And guys, what I want to share with you as we unpack that a little bit is if you struggle in your family with, with kids that are jealous of one another, you have to look at your parenting. If you struggle with kids that deceive and lie, you have to look at your parenting. If you're angry that your kids are talk a certain type of way, you got to look at your parenting. My wife and I, we've been blessed to have four kids. I don't have favorites. My kids don't believe me, but I don't. I tell them all the time, I equally like all of you and equally dislike all of you the same amount. Like, that's what I tell them. And then they're like, but if you had a favorite, who would I be? Uh, who would it be? I would say who was ever behaving the most that day. It's certainly going to be my favorite. Now, that's some tongue-in-cheek joking going on. But the truth is, I don't have favorites. Here is the truth I've always told my kids. I appreciate different attributes about each of you. Neither of you are the same. There's not two of you that are identical. You are uniquely made by God, and there's certain attributes I love and appreciate about you, attributes I love and appreciate about you, and vice versa. And what that amounts to for me is I have a very different relationship with each of my kids. You know, in, in some situations, you get parents that say, hey, I can't understand why one kid grew up, hated their Guess their upbringing, and the other one celebrates it so much, you got to look at your parenting. What I discovered very early on is that I am not one parent to four kids. 
I am four different types of parent to four very different children, and I act in a way according to what their greatest needs are of me as a parent. So when my kids were younger, and they're like, how come when I misbehave, you do this, but when she misbehaves, you do that? And I say, because you require that. You're hard-headed and stubborn and all those things, and your sister's contrite. If you develop some of those those things in your heart, my response might be different. And sure enough, maturity happened. She did. And she was like, Dad, looking back, I realized it was never that I was loved differently. It's that I responded differently. And I said, exactly. And what you needed was further accountability. What he or she needed was a deeper talk. Four different types of parents based according to their needs. My kids all have different love languages. They do. Four different love languages. And you know what? time spent is for one kid, the other kid is gift giving, uh, the other kid is deep talks, the other one just wants to do silent side by side time, and you know what I am? Acts of service and kindness. Like, I don't really want to talk. Man, you know what? I just, I just want to do for you. What can I do? What can I build for you? What can I, what can I help you with? But you know what? A selfish parent I'm just going to love you the way that suits me best or the way that suits you best, but even though you're different, I'm, no, you know what I do? I have to humble myself as a parent. And I have to love them according to the way God uniquely created them. You see, if your kids are pitted against each other, it's likely our fault. And if you play favorites, it's actually a sin because God doesn't play favorites. The Bible actually says God shows no partiality. God does not show favoritism. It's why Paul totally, man, he got loud and in charge with Peter in correction because there was favoritism. If you play favorites as a parent, an aunt or an uncle, it's probably sin in your life because you're actually cheating all your other children, nieces and nephews, and you're highlighting one, but what you're teaching that one is to be entitled, to be selfish, to think somehow they're better than others. Guys, we have to, we have to look at that. And that's actually what Rebecca was doing with her sons, uh, Jacob and Esau. Kids learn what is caught, not what is taught. Kids don't learn from what you speak. They learn from what they observe you doing as a parent. I got a friend, I'm gonna call him Billy, because sometimes he watches online. <laughs> so if you know I'm talking about you, bro, sorry. Um, so Billy, I've known over 20 years, and he calls me sometimes in desperation, and he's like, Armando, my kids yell all the time. I can't stand how loud they are. They're always yelling. They're fighting. They're bickering, and I'm like, Billy, I've known you 20 years. You are a loud dude. You fight, and, and you know what? Can I speak about your marriage real quick? And he gives me permission, and I'm like, you know what? You, you call me all the time. You, Sometimes you don't hold back. You, you know, you, you yell and you argue with your wife and then you get angry for your kids doing that with each other and showing disrespect. And I say, Billy, you know what? Kids learn what is caught, not what is taught. You got to look at your parenting. Your kids are either going to be, and this is something God convicted me with years ago. I remember years ago, you know, I'm a hot-blooded Italian. That's how I was raised, and God saved me, and now I'm just part of the family of Jesus, and I'm trying to get away from uh, being like the dysfunction we were raised in. Sorry, my sister's in the back, but you know what I'm talking about? And I'm never talking about you. It's the other sister in Long Island we talk about, okay? So you, you know what? One day, uh, I think it was an argument early on. I must have been 24, 25 years old. Uh, I'm on a train going to Nyack College. is where I went to school. And uh, I think my wife and I had an, had an argument. And I was really prideful, and I never wanted to be wrong. Most of the time, she is right, I will tell you that. God has given her some serious discernment, wisdom, and maturity I lacked early on. And I remember sitting on the train praying. Because you don't look at anybody when you're on a train, right? You got crazy eyes looking at you and you just got to look down. So that's what I was doing. I was filling my time with Jesus. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Armando, you're either going to be a blessing that I've intended you to be for your family or you're going to be their curse. You choose. Wow. That hit me heavy. That hit me really heavy. So Jacob, listening to his mother, verse 25 of chapter 27, his father calls him in and he said, my son, he thinks he's Esau. Bring me some of that game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate it. And he brought him some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him, kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he said, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son, Esau, of course, is like the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the heaven's dew and the earth's riches and abundance of grain and wine. May the nations serve you and the peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may, your, uh, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. What an amazing blessing that was never meant for him. 
It was meant for the first son. So then Esau, after doing what his father had asked him to do, he comes home. And he gets in the kitchen and he starts making the game and he, and he hollers to his dad, Dad, it's Esau, your firstborn son, and I'm so excited, Dad, to give you what you asked for and I am so pumped about getting this blessing that you have reserved for me. Verse 33, Isaac trembled violently. Say trembled. And he said, who is it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came in, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. I can't take it back. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, bless me too, father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. You see, and this is why God hates lying. It's because of what it does to you what it does to people in your life, what it does to your relationships, your dating relationships, and your marriages. You think just because something is hidden in your life, you think it doesn't have an effect. You see, when you're lying to your husband and wife and they don't know it yet, it will be exposed. What happens is we, we take a step back in the relationship because we can't both do wrong and love you fully and completely at the same time. And we hear things like, you feel so distant to me today. Why did you change the passcode on your cell phone? Why, why, not that I want to, but why don't I have access to your social media? Why are you living your life so hidden, so distant? You see, you can't love and do wrong at the same time. You either love completely and you will be a blessing, or you love incompletely, protecting yourself, and you and I will live as a curse. And you know what happens? We steal and we rob emotions, intimacy, connection from our spouses, dating relationships, our, our parents, our siblings, all at the expense of self, all at the expense, I guess at the, at the hope of self-preservation. And this is why God hates lying so much. It's because it separates us from other people. We become self-deceived. And what happens when we become self-deceived, we take on labels God never meant for you. He wants you to be called a child of God, an heir to the throne of God, grafted in. You are the apple of his eye. His special treasure, scripture says, but when I lie and I'm unrepentant and not turning away, all as I really am is a liar. When I cheat, when I steal and I don't change, all as I am is a cheater and a, and a, and a thief. And you know what? Then you got the enemy of your soul saying, that's right, that's what you are. And then you can't even look God in the eye anymore. We can't even repent. We feel too dirty for God. This is where many Christians struggle and say, God can't use me. Do you know what I've done? And Jesus looks down on you and says, if you just turn from your sins and turn to me, do you know what I paid for? I paid for everything you've done. And I could forgive you and give you a clean start, but it requires two things. It requires faith, and you need to turn your back on the things that are creating stumbling stones in your life. Walk away from it. Turn your back on it. If it's pornography, you need some help. Walk away from it. If it's cheating on your taxes, go find a Christian accountant, and he or she will help you. If it's deception and you need help getting truth out, go talk to your pastor or counselor or a brother or sister in Christ to help you to have an honest relationship so that you can live and walk in the blessings that God has for you. There's nothing worse than hiding and knowing you're hiding because you feel phony. You feel like a fake, and what it leads to is shame and guilt, and it's God's desire that you would be freed from shame and guilt so you would not have to wear it. Because you know what? I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking about this. I said, God, why, why is lying so wrong? Are you showing me some things? And then I recall Jesus saying that uh, the devil's native language was lying. He's a liar. So when we lie, this convicted me years ago. I heard somebody say this to somebody else. Thank God they didn't say it to me, but it almost crushed me. They said, man, you're never more like Satan except when you lie. And I thought, I never want to lie again. <laughs> never. So Satan is the father of lies. It's his native tongue. But Jesus is truth. And the truth will set you free. And you know what? Sometimes we hide things and we're like, man, I don't want to go through the pain. I don't want to go through the shame, the guilt, the self-exposure. But if you don't expose yourself... God loves you enough that he's going to expose you so you can be healed. That's the truth. That's the reality. But we set ourselves free. But the th reason why we continue to live in hiding is because we don't trust God enough. Do we trust God that it's going to be okay? Do we trust God that he's going to fix it? Do we trust God that he's going to make it right? So Esau, this is where he's at. And he said to his father, do you only have one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, 
Your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless and will throw off his yoke off your neck, Esau held a grudge, say grudge, against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to him, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Let's talk about grudges for a moment. The outcome of lies that are unrepentant and unfixed is grudge. There are people that may be bitter or resentful in your life because you have lied to them. You have deceived them. But you know, we're in a culture today that it's like, well, you know what? If you got offended, that's your problem. You need to fix it. And there's a little bit of truth in that and a little bit of a lie, which makes it a complete lie, right? Here's the truth. The truth is, in this life, you're going to get offended. And it is between you and God to choose not to live in a prison of offense, to be a person who forgives, to forgive freely, to give grace, to give mercy. However, it doesn't get the offender off the hook. You are still liable and accountable for God for the way you carry yourself, the way you speak, and the way you impact people's lives. Both have to walk right before God. You know what? Esau had a grudge, and you know what? That holding on to that, threatening to murder, it was his own sin. But his brother Jacob was responsible for that. Now, some of you are sitting here today, and you're like, wait a minute, though. He was the son of promise. Somehow God allowed all that, and you're right, because God is faithful, just, and God will use all things for good for those who love God. We are not judging Jacob's heart. We're not judging Jacob's purpose. What we know is that lying is wrong, and what we know is that theft is a sin. We know that. However, yes, God still used it for good. Why? Because he's faithful, and because repentance is a real thing, and God can turn things around, but you and I are responsible for the people we lie to and how they walk away from those lies. When Rebecca was told uh, what her oldest son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you, right? As if it's Jacob's fault alone, right? Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay stay with him for a while until your brother's fury uh, subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? She lost her son Esau's heart. He turned away from his mother because, man, Scripture shows us she she lost both. And she didn't want to lose Jacob to death, so she sent them away. But remember that curse she said on herself? May that curse be on me. In that one moment, that decision she made, her household was torn apart. It was torn apart. She sent one son away. There was no longer a relationship with him because he's far and there's, hey, I can't text you. I can't FaceTime you. Man, none of, there's no connection, literally, as if he was a world away. And the other one wanted nothing to do with her anymore because of the deception. Because of the deception. And that's what lies do. It brings bondage. It destroys families. It destroys you. Truth, truth brings freedom. But what's the core reason why people lie? Why we struggle with lie? Whether it's intentional Or maybe it's the accidental lie and it goes under our radar because we're hurting people. It's because we don't trust God completely. That's the only reason why we try to compensate. And that's really what it is. I lie for my own good. That's why you and I lie, whether it's on purpose or accidental, we lie for our own good. So that somehow we can reclaim what we feel has been stolen. So why do we lie? Here's a few reasons that are really common to us here in church. One, to protect. Why do kids lie up to six years old? If you have a child who's lying, uh, guys, I hate to break the news, you taught them to lie. Uh, Although some of that's natural. They're born into sin, and it's not hard to lie when you're stained by sin. Kids lie. But there's really two reasons why they lie up to about five or six years old. They lie, number one, to avoid punishment. That's number one. Lie number two, they lie so you can be impressed with them because they want your love and affection, and they feel like you're distracted. So we train kids to lie. Lying comes natural, but the behavior that happens over and over again becomes habitual. That's what we reinforce or break as parents, right? It's the, how habitual it becomes. And when something becomes habitual long enough, it creates neural pathways in your brain. And that habit becomes an addictive pattern of behavior. So people lie to protect. People lie to fulfill. Man, I just want people to be proud of me. I want people to love me. I'm trying to fulfill something deep in my life. So I put on a persona or a mask so that, you will, so that I will be what you need me to be, so that I may receive from you what I'm looking for, whether it's love, validation, incorporate me into your friendship group. Some of us lie to deceive others, and it's all about control and ma- manipulation. Many of us as adults, we lie to hide. If you only knew what I did, if you only knew where I was, if you only knew what you don't know, we lie to hide. 
And the reasons why we do that is we, we don't want to deal with the shame, the exposure, the guilt, the shame, or even the consequences of hurting somebody else in our lives. We lie for acceptance. We lie to impress. So how do we get past a lie that we may not even be aware of that's happening in our lives? And so many of you may be there, right? You tell a story, and then after, if you feel the conviction, you're like, oh, why did I add that detail? Why did I make that seem more exciting than it really was? You know, why do some of the things that happened in the story change based on who I tell the story to? Because you're looking for something. So what Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things beyond cure. Who can understand it? Regardless, hold on to this thought, regardless of what your reason to lie is, we exchange obedience to God for the pursuit of what we think that lie will deliver. Guys, you're going to serve it. If you lie, you're going to serve your lies. Romans 1.25 says this, we exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. So how do we go from, all right, we're all on the same page, we struggle with lies, we see the damage, we understand why God hates it, what in the world do I do with it? I go to church and I'm told not what not to do, but how do I actually make that an action step? How do I do something with it? You, you know what maturing Christians do, number one? Three things we gotta do. One, you gotta own it got to be honest with yourselves. If you're someone who's in a relationship and you struggle to apologize when you do wrong, or maybe you never say I'm sorry, or, or people tell you you never apologize, and you're like, yeah, sure I do. The truth is if people are telling you that, you probably struggle with that, but it's really self-deception. Why? Because if I'm wrong, it means somehow I'm inadequate. I'm not good enough. Guys, we're medicating something deep within ourselves. Honest Christ followers need to be honest with ourselves. We have to own it. God, I have sinned. I have lied. Would you forgive me, Jesus? Like, it starts with ownership. Number two is confession. Why do, we, uh, uh, why do we confess sin? We go to God to confess sin because it's only through God, through Jesus Christ, that we receive forgiveness of sin. And we gain that fresh start, that new beginning. It really is hope. And, and number three, responsible Christians make it right. We own it, we confess it, we make it right. We confess it to God for forgiveness. We confess it to others to be set free and to have healing. I'm going to say that again. We confess sin to God for forgiveness. He's the only one that can forgive, ultimately, right? But we confess to others for healing. And we get that first part. We're comfortable with that first part because Scripture tells us, right, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But it's that second part. Do I really have to go to someone and share truth with them. James 5, 16 says this, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. If you want healing, you gotta confess. The prayers of the righteous person has great power and working. You see, under the old covenant, your relationship was just vertical. If I've done wrong, I've sinned against God and God alone. And you know what? It was made right because the high priest would sacrifice. So I would go to God. And then under the new covenant in Jesus, he, he helps us to understand the law. And he says, the, the law is really summed up by these two great ones. It's these two great commandments, right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the second is like it, he says. To love your neighbor as yourself. So wait a minute. You're saying to worship God, to love God, means I have to love horizontally too? According to Jesus, it does. He actually teaches us a, in an interesting parable, Matthew 5, 21. He teaches us this parable about this guy who goes into church, and he's got offerings, gifts, sacrifices he's given to God. And he says, you need to leave that at the altar before you worship God vertically. You need to leave that all at the altar and go make your horizontal relationships right. Go to that person who you've sinned against, that has maybe sinned against you, and you need to make it right. Then come back and make your offering. Why? Because to be right with God, it's not about works. Only Jesus makes us right. But to live right, to worship in spirit and in truth, the Bible says you can't say you love God and hate your brother. Guys, lying to one another is hatred because I'm sowing seeds of death and destruction into your life. You can't say you love God and hate your brother, otherwise the truth is we're just lying to ourselves. So to love God means to love well horizontally. You see the old covenant, like I said, it was just vertical. Jesus expands that for us, helps us to understand the truth of God and that we worship God by the way we treat one another. But here's the problem. 
Sometimes you can't help it. Look, we're sick. Even as followers of Jesus, there's still sin. I'm still a sinner saved by grace. Until I'm made right in glory, until this project of God is made complete when I enter heaven, you know what? I may not sin intentionally. I may not choose to live in sin unrepentantly, but I got to tell you, you cut me off in traffic. Depending what day it is, you're going to get Jesus or you're going to get the old me. But every day there's a little more Jesus and a little less me, right? I die to myself. I become alive to Christ. You see, you can't get past this lying condition we're in apart from grace. You can get past intentional lies. You can live in character and integrity. But one day you're going to tell a story and you're going to add details and you're going to be like, oh, snap, I messed up. One day you're going to delete a detail. One day you're going to realize you lied to, you lied to your kids or to your spouse and you're feeling convicted and you're like, man, I need to go back and make that right. And the Holy Spirit's going to empower you to do that. That's the accidental lie. You see, what you can't do, that's what grace is all about. Jesus picks up where you fail because you are not a failure in Christ Jesus. You're an overcomer. Why? Because he's done a work in your life. Man, you are not a victim. You are a victor in Christ Jesus. You can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. So I can live just, I can live right. And when I sin, grace abounds. Scripture says there is forgiveness for you. There is grace for you. There is mercy for you. But it starts with a relationship with Jesus. And if you're in a relationship with Jesus, throw off the cloak of shame and guilt. And that was yesterday. I'm going to focus on Today, I'm going to confess, God, forgive me for what I did yesterday. I need a new beginning today, and I know that's available in Jesus. Hey, what's up? My name is Armando. I'm the pastor of Fusion Church, and we are so excited that you followed along in this message. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you did, make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you feel led by God to support the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do that in a number of ways. Number one, pray for us, pray with us. God is doing some great things here at Fusion Church, and that is probably the best way for you to be part of it. The second way is if you live locally, please come out and visit us. Come, uh, come and enjoy service with us, and if you feel led to, you can even join our team and become a teammate. And the third way is if you feel led by God to give to the ministry of Fusion Church, you can do so by going to our website, www.fusionchurchny.com, and hit the giving tab. With that being said, guys, God bless you. Hope you enjoy the next message.